we'll stop. And there's a queue outside. If possible, please make a U-turn. It's looking quite full as it is, isn't it? It's the 24th of February and we're on a retro road trip. We Although, are. right now, where we are isn't very retro. Unless you count Gerald, I suppose, he's no. not here. It's all right, um, yeah. We are at Diddley Squat Farm Shop. Hey, we made it, finally. And, and we've got to recommend Jeremy's Sausage, which is really good. I loved biting on Jeremy's Sausage, it must be said. It was very <laughs> tasty. And the coffee's great too. It was, the coffee was really yeah. nice. Yeah, yeah. There's probably, you've probably seen there's quite a queue for the shop, which is extending right off into the distance now. That would be wild, because we were well, we were a good 15, 20 minutes yeah. waiting and it wasn't long. Yeah. But it's worth it. It's yeah. good. Definitely. Yeah. So, uh, next stop, the Bristol Hi-Fi show, which also isn't very retro. No. Though there may but be gramophones. There will be gramophones. Mm. Final, yeah. I think the kids call it. Oh, do they? Yes. All right. <laughs> right, onward to the Batmobile, Robin. <laughs> Well, we can't leave without showing you the shopping experience, so here we are lining up by the barn. It doesn't take too long to reach the door, where you find that the queue continues all the way to the counter. There isn't much wiggle room, so once inside you have to make your selections quickly. <laughs> what they have on sale is all locally produced along with reusable containers for the milk vending machines outside. There are various chutneys and pickles, Hawkstone beer, well they've just had a delivery so it's literally all over the shop. And over on this side there's a chiller with local sausage, bacon and some very nice looking pies. There's more fresh produce on the centre table, in danger of being knocked over by passing crowds. In fact, I nearly took out that loaf on the end as I passed. And over at the back we have the chilli chutney, cooking oil, honey and crisps made with potatoes grown on the farm. They have merchandise such as t-shirts on display, but for now they can't sell those as they aren't made locally. But if you ask, they will give you a discount code that will get you free postage from the website. To be fair to them, I won't show that here. Returning the tiny shopping basket to the front of the queue, we'll now walk round to have a look at the big view. The restaurant of the same name still hasn't been built thanks to more silly planning decisions, so what they have is a cafe bar with outdoor seating and a relatively short queue. The menu has three breakfast options, two lunches and a couple of specials like the attack cow chilli, and it varies according to the time of day. We were here at breakfast time so we each chose a local pork sausage sandwich and then realised we should have ordered a bacon one and gone halves. Anyway, no complaints, the brioche bun was well filled and very tasty. And as I already mentioned, the coffee was a cut above your average cafe fare too. Beautiful. With breakfast finished and a few items purchased from the shop, we left the queue stretching onto the horizon and continued on our way. This stop was a bit of a detour from our usual route, but worth doing as a one-off visit. The scenery is quite good around here. It is. It's nice because we sit in spot. We headed out through Chadlington and all that scenic farmland and on to the west. Fields anyway, yeah. over there. I think it's sort of over there then, you know. So, to the Bristol Hi-Fi Show, held every year barring pandemics at the Bristol Marriott here on the right. An annual pilgrimage to see and hear all kinds of expensive equipment and where the price of a really poor sandwich makes the fare at Diddley Squat Farm look like even better value. Seriously, there are much better food options a short walk from the hotel, but we were pressed for time. This show is basically a hotel takeover. The ground floor and conference rooms are turned into exhibition space and demonstration areas, 
and upstairs many of the bedrooms have been cleared of furniture so they can be used as demonstration rooms. Some vendors like to give a talk about their products, some just play music or in rare cases you'll find a full cinema setup. It isn't perfect though, sometimes the room acoustics are poor and sometimes the equipment is just too big for those rooms, but this is a good place to listen and decide for yourself what you like, even if some of it's well out of your budget. This is what the upstairs corridors look like, each bedroom has a sign over the door telling you who's in there, although a lot of the time I don't recognise the names, but you're free to wander in and listen or chat. Uh, I'm going to leave you with a selection of pictures from some of the rooms, but I won't attempt to film them all, there really isn't any point. Despite having a little less time than usual, we managed to get around the whole exhibition, although we did miss out on a couple of items such as the Watt Hi-Fi demo. And so after another drive, this time over to Sirencester and a well-earned night's sleep, we were up early and made our way to Chalford Mill for our next stop on the Retro Tour. Retro Collective. Day two of the retro road trip and finally we're getting some real retro. Here we are at Chalford Mill, home of the YouTube channel RMC The Cave and The Physical Cave and also Arcade Archive and um, we're going to see both today. The Cave is a combination of YouTube studio and retro computer museum run by proprietor Neil. Here we're standing at the studio end of the cave where the videos are made. There are plans to add more tables for additional computers at this end of the room, but for now there's lots of kit on display, much of which I recognised, and quite a lot that I didn't. Yeah. Yeah. There's the uh, what's the the Mont Vista system. <laughs> Cheetah sweet talker. I thought that was in like a round box though. Yeah. Slightly better design. Yeah. This is all the stuff I never owned. Eighty one was the one I had first. Being nosy, I had a good rummage through Neil's drawers. Oh, the drawers are getting a bit bare down the bottom. to go at our very own Hello Cave Dwellers, but unfortunately we can barely hear what Paul said about the Amstrad GX400, which is probably a good thing as it wasn't very complimentary. Here is the fake shop, a room set out to look like the computer software corner at WH Smith. It's full of box software sorted by computer system just as it would have been in the day. They also have a Mr. Multisystem running with a unique barcode scanner which can load and run a compatible game simply by pulling the box off the shelf and scanning the barcode. And it really does work. Draw distance on Sarge, and that was awful, wasn't it? Um, I remember that though. You, it was better, I think, on the on the main game than it was on on the demo. Right. E type was good. Yeah, it was all right, but I mean, look at the artwork on it. You know, that, what, what year did this come out? Nineteen ninety four. Yeah. Really? 
Although I didn't get him on video, we had a lengthy chat with Neil about all things retro, and we also donated some game controllers and other items that they could use in the museum. Here's the hands-on area, where you can get stuck in and use any of the computers on display. There's also a library and shelves full of handheld games, most of them playable. I had a look through the magazines as there was a specific issue I hoped to find, but unfortunately they didn't have it. But I did find a copy of Acorn A World in Pixels, which I hadn't seen in person before. Raven's <laughs> gone. I vaguely remember the name. Pretty cool game. It was kind of a mix. It looks like Repton, but it's more mm. like puzzle solving. After a brief stop for lunch, we moved over to the Arcade Archive, which is currently on the ground floor of the mill. Firstly the studio room, which has some work in progress, and then we head into the main arcade. As you can see, this place is stuffed with classic arcade games, and after a brief tour for the camera, that was put away and many games were played. All in all, a thoroughly enjoyable visit, and it looks like they have plans to expand further, so I'll have to plan another trip in the future. We spent the last half hour back up in the cave as it got very busy down there. Um, but eventually we had to leave and we headed off towards Milton Keynes for the next stopover and our final leg of the trip. Sunday morning, the last day of the retro road trip. And this is retro for me because right there, many years ago, is where I used to live. However, all those years ago, what we didn't know, over there, across the main road and behind those houses, was a top secret installation and that's what we're visiting today. Here we are at Bletchley Park, home of the wartime code breakers but not used for that purpose since the war. I probably walked through the gardens as a child but now they're part of a museum which is well worth paying a visit. Rather than being a stuffy static exhibition with a bit of signage, it draws you in with wall-sized films and atmospheric sounds in the rooms. Original and delicate items are preserved behind glass, but many of the exhibits are interactive, and while some of these are simple, a lot of the information is very detailed. So if you want to, you can get into all the technical details of the decryption process, 
but even coming from an engineering background I have to say I struggled with some of it. In Buckinghamshire, offices are closed down, papers burned, machines dismantled. The group of people that no one knows about or has even heard of quietly disperses, unnamed, uncelebrated. But they have won their own war, the Cold War. This is Bletchley Park. It happened here. The site consists of a collection of separate buildings. You're free to wander around yourself or you can take the guided tour. Here in the mansion you can walk around the ground floor, which is where the workers were first placed at the start of the war. Here's the boss's office, for example, and a repurposed library which was once packed full of desks before they had anywhere else to work. Then you can see many of the huts and blocks that were built to house the expanding workforce. Some of these have been turned into exhibition space and others are dressed as close as possible to the way that they would have been during the war. There's so much to see and to understand here that you need a lot of time to fully appreciate this museum. There's a lot more here than I've covered in this video too, so much so that the visit took a fair bit longer than we expected. We'll stop here with a view of Alan Turing's office in Hut 8, but there's plenty to see beyond this point. After lunch we moved over to the National Museum of Computing, located at the back of the site. Now how do I explain this lot? Here's an Enigma machine, and to use it to decode a message we need the settings, and they were changed daily by the Germans. So a room full of these was built. The bomb cycles through the settings until it decodes a commonly used phrase in the message. It was mechanical so it took a while, but once the settings were found they could decrypt all the messages for that day. After Enigma came the more complex Lorenz on the left and something faster than the bomb was needed, so the first attempt was this thing called the Heath Robinson. It was named after a cartoonist who drew impossibly complicated machines that performed simple tasks. We didn't have a Lorenz machine, so the Tunny on the left was built to simulate it and to decode the messages. The Heath Robinson was replaced completely by Colossus, and this was the world's first electronic computer. The fact that we were able to decode messages encrypted by Lorenz was never made public, and this is why the whole thing was kept secret until the mid-1970s. All of the larger machines you see here are reconstructions. The history behind that work is also documented here, along with all manner of parts and test equipment. The museum also has many other computers on display, some of them room sized like this Decatron, which is the oldest working computer, and also many home and office computers and handheld devices. Most of what they have is in working order, and there are some hands on areas where you can try them out for yourself. Over a cup of tea in the shop, I noticed shelves of historic magazines out in the corridor, and once again I went out and had a hunt for a certain issue of the micro user. This time I found it, the reason being that in my one and only claim to fame I had a letter published, 
and it was the £10 prize winner of the month. The article explains how to hook two BBC micros together to get more free memory, with included demo programs, though sadly a typesetting error lost a percent symbol from line 90, resulting in the demo drawing black triangles on a black background. I hope people that tried it managed to spot the error. Incidentally, I'm still waiting for my £10. Amongst other things, the shop had a selection of books for sale, and I found that they had the Acorn World in Pixels book, which I was looking at in the cave, so I decided to buy one. Yes, so, uh, we'll finish with a view of a working classroom completely full of BBC and other Acorn computers, the like of which I haven't seen since the 1980s. And with that, we headed back to the car and made our way north towards home and the end of our road trip. And here is that Acorn book, a weighty volume, I have to say, and a good memento of the weekend. I'll have a read through of that later on. And since I'm an official cave dweller, I have to have the official mug to prove it. And also a car sticker, which in itself these days is a bit retro. I'll stick this on in a minute. I didn't buy anything from the main Bletchley Park gift shop, but it is big and well stocked, so do take a look at that if you visit. Of course, I had to have the obligatory t-shirt from the farm, and also I brought back some of the crisps, which are excellent, and the lager, which I haven't tried yet. I think my highlight for the weekend is Bletchley Park, and incidentally, the tickets you buy turn out to be annual passes. You can reuse them, so maybe I'll find an excuse to come back. Well, that was a busy weekend, and I really don't know how I'm going to top this for the next trip. I'll leave links below for all the places we visited, so do take a look at those. Meanwhile, thanks for watching, and stay tuned as there's more gadgety stuff coming on this channel. Bye for now.